Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. It is uh, my honor and privilege to open uh, the afternoon session and the last session of the ABIR uh, conference. So far, we had uh, splendid uh, panelists uh, starting yesterday, and we are going to finish with what will hopefully be another interesting uh, panel. Uh, and a very interesting uh, subject, uh, the Arab Spring, uh, obviously, every one of us knows that that was uh, happening, what was happening in the last uh, year. In fact, uh, we are in many ways commemorating, or should I say celebrating, uh, one year, the first uh, year of the revolution that occurred in Tunisia, started with Tunisia and then moved to Egypt, Libya, and now uh, Syria is in the middle of what we can say a kind of a civil war. And uh, we'll hear what uh, is going to happen there. Um, before I move and uh, present uh, the distinguished uh, panel, uh, one still missing, but she is going to come any minute. Um, I want just as a starter to say a few words about uh, the subject itself. First of all, we use very often the term uh, Arab Spring. Um, I think that by now it's quite evident that the term is a little bit misleading uh, because um, uh, it is clear that the term itself is a very positive one, uh, meaning something <coughs> which is positive, favorable, something that uh, uh, maybe uh, hints at uh, the democratic changes that are about to take place. But in reality, uh, we see a more complicated uh, situation. Uh, probably we might get there, and we might eventually see that it had been an Arab Spring, but for the time being, we are still witnessing different seasons, so to speak. Uh, we see a summer, we see maybe a winter, if it concerns uh, Syria. Uh, so therefore, I, a few months ago, I uh, was talking about uh, Vivaldi and the Four Seasons. So this is maybe more appropriate. But usually, you know, reality is much stronger because we like and we use terms or slogans, which in a way describe the situation. And so we came with the spring, although not necessarily it fully represents what is going on. And it's also uh, quite obvious that what is going on in Egypt, and I want to offend any one of the panelists here, one representing Syria and the other Libya, uh, of course, what is going on in Egypt is very crucial because of the significance of Egypt in Arab, uh, in the Arab world. That was the situation in the past, and post probably this is the situation right now. And what is going on in Egypt might stand as a kind of a model for what might happen in other Arab countries. That was the situation with the Arab Revolution in the 50s, and with Arab socialism, and with Arab nationalism. So. That might be the situation uh, in Egypt as well. So there are many questions. Uh, most of them we are not in a position to really answer. But at least I think even posing the questions is very important because we want to follow the events. And while we follow, we would like to say something significant about what is going on. And that is the importance of what we are doing, although we don't have any good perspective to say something very significant of what is going on. OK, after these prelimi preliminary remarks, let's move uh, to our discussion. Um, the first speaker is Professor Eyal Zissa from Tel Aviv University. And I want already to apologize on his behalf, because uh, shortly after, he will have to go back to Tel Aviv University. He has a class to, to teach. Uh, so we'll take uh, some of the questions immediately after his um, uh, lecture. Uh, Professor Eyal Zista is the dean of the Faculty of Humanities at the Hebrew University and is a very well-known... <laughs> I said Hebrew University? Uh, wow. okay. well, what a mistake, come. huh? Mm. What Freud would have said about it, huh, Eyal? <laughs> 
That is interesting, yeah, I'll take it with me. No, of course, Tel Aviv University, <laughs> and he's a very well-known expert on Syria and Lebanon. I'm not going to uh, start to enumerate all his publications, books, and articles on the subject, and uh, so I'll just uh, mention that he is going to talk about spring in Damascus, the renewal of the struggle for Syria. You have 20 minutes. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. Well, uh, we have to mention that, uh, or maybe I should start with the bottom line because we are in a hurry. Uh, will Bashar survive when this regime uh, will come to its end? First of all, uh, the answer has two parts. A, I don't know when. B, I don't know, I'm not sure at all uh, that it will come to its end. And now let me elaborate and let, let me uh, uh, address, uh, address this uh, question in details. Um, Syria already witnessed a spring. It was uh, shortly after Bashar became president in the mid-summer of 2000, and this spring came to its end in uh, uh, mid-winter -win 2001, and uh, what Bashar had to say about this, uh, uh, this spring was that he never liked spring, <laughs> and that in the Middle East, he said, anyone who knows the weather in the Middle East knows that actually we don't have really a spring in the Middle East. It's the mild winter, and immediately we move to the summer. I believe he still doesn't like spring. <laughs> Nevertheless, I mean, we uh, cannot, uh, can we see the, oh, the map? Yeah. Well, w when we look at what happened uh, during the last year, it's unprecedented. Clearly, if we look at the sites, can you show us so it would be more easy for me? Of in the city of Dara. And when, when people in Syria uh, watch uh, these sites uh, through the internet or through Al Jazeera or Al Arabiya, well, when observers from outside Syria watch these scenes, well, clearly uh, Iraq came to its end. And when you look at these pictures, you clearly get the impression that the uh, Bashar is Finnish. Nevertheless, nevertheless there is a the different Syria. Uh, there is the, the other Syria. There is the other Syria uh, with the help of the Syrian TV. <laughs> so, but but the, the pictures are less important, but these are real authentic pictures from the center of Damascus several months ago, but there were such demonstrations several weeks uh, before. Uh, it's a very simple song with one word, Bin Khibbak, we like you. Yeah. Now, of course you can argue that uh, unlike uh, Yeah. Now, you can always argue that, you know, these were uh, organized demonstrations, students brought to these demonstrations from schools and uh, workers from the ministries and uh, uh, factories, and still the fact is that unlike Egypt, where we, uh, Maidan uh, Tahrir Square was conquered by, you know, uh, demonstrators who protested against the regime. In Syria, the picture is entirely different. What have we seen in Syria during the last, uh, the last year, and what is the significance of, of the Syrian revolution? Can we see the, the map of Syria? Now, in January 2011, when uh, 
Mubarak, uh, when Egypt witnessed the last days of Mubarak, Bashar gave a very interesting interview to Wall Street Journal where he said, you know, Syria is different. Syria is not Tunisia, Syria is not Egypt, Syria is different. And uh, here it cannot happen because the people like me, that's something he said also yesterday, they really like me. At the same time, and, and, and I think he really believes that he still enjoy uh, much support within uh, the population of, of his country, but at the same time, the other argument was, well, I'm with the Mukawama, I'm with the resistance. I mean, Mubarak was a traitor, you know, he didn't say traitor, he, but Mubarak worked with the Americans, had peace with Israel, we are different, and he really believed that uh, the whole business, the whole question of Mukawama will be something that might uh, help him. Well, he still enjoys, as we know, the support of Iran, but uh, to watch uh, Sheikh Gardawi attacking him so bluntly, to see Azmil Pshara uh, on Al Jazeera TV attacking this kind of regime, well, as we, as we can see, he didn't help him, but at the same time, Syria is unique, Syria is different. To what extent? First of all, when we look at the map and you know the history of the Syrian revolution, it started in uh, the city of Dara, uh, Banias, and then uh, in, in Hama. And from uh, these three cities, it spread to Al Jazeera, to the periphery uh, here, southern to Damascus, it's the shore, and well, now it's also Hama Homs and northern Syria. This is the first uh, uh, difference. In, in Syria, it had to do with Cairo. In, in Egypt, it had to do with Cairo. Miri will correct me if I'm wrong. It had to do with Cairo and Alexandria, the big cities. In Egypt, it had to do with the middle class, the upper middle cl class, that got fed with um, the regime of Hosni Mubarak. This is entirely not the case uh, with Syria. In Syria, it, it's uh, 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 what we know from history, a uh, revolt of the peasants, peasant revolt, a against the very clear uh, social and economic uh, problems or even crisis that Syria witnessed in, in those areas during the last, let's say, several uh, years. This is the kind of uh, protest we uh, see nowadays in Syria. <coughs> It started in the periphery. It's still uh, quite limited to the peripheral area. Uh, the only exception is maybe the big, two big cities, Homs and Hama, each uh, one million uh, people. But uh, still, Damascus and Aleppo, the middle class and the upper middle class, well, um, they haven't joined yet this uh, revolution. Another thing, but at the same time, this is on the one hand. On the other hand, the periphery is important if you look back at the history of Syria. When we look at the city of uh, Dara, and you, you, you watch this clip showing what uh, the demonstration tried to do to the statue of Hafez al-Assad, the periphery was used to be the source of support of the Ba'ath regime, the major basis of support. That's where the Ba'ath regime actually came from. If we look at the past regime that ruled Syria for the last uh, 60 or uh, uh, almost uh, 60 years, well, part of it had to do with the Alawite community. But the Alawites were not alone. We speak here about a very complicated coalition based on the support of minority communities, but also of the Sunni periphery. And when we speak about the Sunni periphery, we speak exactly about places like Dar'a, where the vice president, Farouk Ashara, came from, or Al Jazeera, the resort, Abu Kamal, or uh, the coastal area, or northern Syria, where many of the current leaders, Sunni leaders of Syria, uh, originally uh, came from these uh, places. And for many years, these were supposed to be, these were considered as a major uh, basis of support for the Ba'ath uh, regime. During the previous revolt, in between 76 to 82, uh, there was no any Muslim activity or uh, opposition activity in these regions. They were uh, quiet while 
the revolt <coughs> was uh, limited to Hama, Aleppo, and the other small or uh, big cities in northern Syria, but the periphery, places like Dara or Deir were, uh, were quiet. Now they turn against the Ba'ath regime. This is, I think, what is so significant. And we'll have to wait and see what might be the historical consequences and implication of such an earthquake in uh, Syrian terms. But for the time being, the revolution is still limited, is still limited um, to the, uh, is still limited to the uh, periphery. Now let's uh, uh, have uh, another. Uh, that's how. Uh, what is yes. That's how the events look. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our news for today. An official military source stated that army units in Dara and its countryside continue to chase the armed gangs which attack military positions and security forces. Those gangs cut off public highways in several places, stop people, beat them up, and strip them of their possessions in order to spread panic. They also attack military points near the occupied Golan, killing three soldiers and wounding 15 others. Some armed bandits were also killed and wounded in the clashes. Several members of these gangs were captured and large amounts of various weapons and ammunition were confiscated. The armed units continue to restore normal life to okay. and its countryside in order to achieve yeah. security and stability. Okay, so, so you can see if Bashar watches Syrian TV, clearly that's the impression he gets. If we come back... Okay, yeah. Now, if you if we come back to the if we come back to the map, the situation in Syria as I see it, yes, the uh, protest is there, uh, limited to periphery, but spread all over Syria, uh, but didn't get to the major uh, cities. The regime failed till today in its efforts to suppress these. Uh, we can speak in terms of revolution, this uh, revolution. But at the same time, the revolution or the protest or this wave of protest has, or uh, the opposition ha has its own uh, weaknesses. First of all, there is no opposition. There is no clear alternative to the regime of uh, Bashar al-Assad. Take, for example, the Kurds. Uh, in Syria, there are 22 different Kurdish parties active in Syria. Uh, let's speak about the oppo opposition. There is no real opposition in the sense that there are organized groups uh, operating in Syria. It was spontaneous. It was not organized and not planned uh, in advance. There are local leaders with no organized or central leadership and there are some intellectual outside Syria or inside Syria who are trying to form some sort of a central body but till that moment they failed it took them almost one year but till uh, this moment we can't speak of you know recognize acknowledge uh, based on popular support uh, a, a central body of on opposition and it's a major question for many Syrians who dislike this regime or think that he might fall, but don't find any immediate uh, alternative. When we speak about mainly the upper class, the middle class, the Sunni middle class and the Sunni upper class in Damascus and Aleppo, and we ask ourselves, why do they support the regime? Well, it has to do also not only with, uh, with the resentment, the traditional resentment of the urban segment or the uh, periphery, but also to the fact that for them the source or, or the model of inspiration is not necessarily Egypt, it's Iraq, a country which was liberated by the Americans eight years ago. A democracy was brought to Iraq by the Americans and what is the result? disintegration of the state, ethnic clashes. In Syria, we have the uh, uh, tool of death. It's 80 
30, 20 people dead uh, on a daily basis in Iraq. It can be 100, 150, but who cares? But the Syrians do care. They see what happened in Iraq, and they ask themselves whether they want uh, uh, it to happen also in, uh, in Syria. The bottom line is, as I see it, uh, the regime lost some of its control over the country, but the major basis of support, the minorities. No even one incident of demonstration in Mount Rhodes in the southern part of Syria. No major demonstrations in the Kurdish area. Major. There were some <coughs> events, some incidents, some demonstrations, but not major, not even one major demonstration. Of course, the Christians and the Alawites, altogether 40% out of the total population of Syria, still believe that they don't have a better alternative to the regime. They still believe that maybe the devil they know is better on other uh, option. When we speak about the bureaucracy, when we speak about uh, the army, when we speak about uh, the party, they are still with Bashar. In the case of uh, Libya, Professor Onen can tell us about it in a minute. A day after the revolt started, Gaddafi was left with no diplomat, even one diplomat. Or maybe I'm wrong, but the, the, the tendency was quite clear. Here, a year later, not even one diplomat defected. Why should a Sunni diplomat in Qatar or Cairo find it difficult for him to announce that he leave uh, Bashar? Well, first of all, maybe because he thinks that Bashar might survive, and maybe also because he believes that uh, there is no any better uh, alternative. The army, and the army is not built and based only on the Alawite generals, the top generals, but also on many Sunni soldiers. Now, yes, 10,000, 20,000 out of an army of quarter of a million uh, defected. But not even one major uh, important unit, a company here, a company there, the army is still behind uh, Bashar. The tendency is against him. The region turned against him. Turkey, the Saudis, the uh, Arab countries, yes, that's, that's quite uh, clear. But the question is whether this situation will continue or at this stage or at uh, this point or another, uh, we'll see a turn in the course of uh, event. And I think that the fact that uh, revolution, which started as a quiet and peaceful uh, protest, turned to be very violent, is playing into the hands of the regime. It terrified and deter. Uh, people mainly in the big cities from turning against uh, Bashar. So like in the events of the 70s, eventually the fact that the, re the revolt is turning very violent can help Bashar. Uh, but as we saw in the first picture from Dara, his situation is quite uh, pretty. Generally speaking, when we look at, when we look at Syria, uh, we used to speak uh, about Syria in the 40s and the 50s in terms of the struggle for Syria between the Iraqis, Nasser, the Soviets. The, and, and then uh, came Hafez al-Assad and the Assad dynasty, and this struggle came into an end, and it was quite clear that Assad, Syria has a boss and the central regime. Now, once again, we see the renewal of the struggle for uh, Syria, both domestically, between the periphery and the center, between the Sunni uh, segment and well, the regime based on the Alawite uh, community, but it also has regional dimension because the fact that the Saudis took uh, an anti-Bashar position had to do with the fact that both Saudi Arabia and Turkey see now Syria as uh, 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 another theater uh, of uh, operation, another place where the struggle between Iran and maybe the Shiites, but Iran and the uh, Sunni world, uh, led today by both Turkey and uh, um, the Saudis, well, uh, Syria became uh, a place where uh, part of the struggle can be, be uh, dictated. So my bottom line, as I mentioned before, I don't know when this regime will come to its end. I don't know at all whether it will come to uh, it's him. So that's it. Uh, and now I'm 
Yeah, yeah I yeah. suggest that we move immediately yeah. to the... Yeah. Okay. We just move in this case immediately to the question because Eyal has to leave. Yeah. So please, if you have uh, any questions. But, uh, yes, yeah. please. Yes. Eyal, uh, usually you, uh, you say it's not uh, necessarily an Arab Spring, but yeah. maybe an Islamist uh, winter. We, s we think about the alternative of uh, radical Islam. Okay. Uh, would you say that in Syria the, the worst option is not that necessarily, but the fragmentation? Well, first of all, as for Islam in Syria, Islam uh, was never strong in the periphery. Uh, the, stronghold, the strongholds of, of, of uh, radical Islam uh, were mainly in the big cities, Aleppo, uh, Hama, other uh, places. It's a question. We have no answer uh, for it, whether uh, this protest has to do with, you know, the Islamists. Uh, probably it has to do with the Islamists because it started, as you know, immediately after the prayers in the mosques uh, uh, in, in, on, on Friday, March uh, 2011, and that's where till today the, some of the demonstration uh, um, be began in, in, in the mosques. <coughs> Nevertheless, I don't have a clear answer. Syria is different because 40 percent of the total population well, uh, do belong to, communi uh, to minority communities. Okay, so. Um, if there are elections, we have to take it into uh, consideration. The middle class, the upper middle class, it's not Egypt. Nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, like in the case of uh, Egypt, we don't know whether those who will bring to the end of the regime will be those who uh, might benefit from the collapse and win the election. That's what happened in, in uh, Egypt. The, the Islamists seem to me much more organized, have uh, better uh, popular support, but uh, um, we'll have to uh, wait uh, and see. This is integration of the states, it, it's, it's an option. And, and still, we know the history of Syria. Uh, the French already in the 20s established separate states for the Alawites and the Druze, and nevertheless, it was the decision uh, uh, made by those communities. Uh, not to go on with these separate states, but to join the Syrian state. We see it also in Iraq, uh, autonomy. Uh, um, yes, but not separation. You know, it's not a viable option to establish a Druze state. It's not a viable option to establish an Alawite state. So uh, the collapse of the regime may lead to what we saw in Syria in the 40s, a very weak uh, central government strong but limited army, and each uh, community uh, enjoys some sort of autonomy in its, uh, um, in its region. Uh, that's what might happen in Syria once the regime uh, collapses. Okay, yeah, we'll yeah. collect a few questions. Okay, so okay, write yeah. Them down and, okay. And, uh, but please, very short, okay? Yes, please. How do you explain uh, the surprising Surprisingly, Lebanon has been uh, quiet during uh, this uh, uh, period of the revolution in Syria. Uh, we know that the yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I got, I got, I got. Yes, I got the answer. Before, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Next. Two short questions. This one, I would like to to speak about the Russian uh, okay. position uh, to which extent they will okay. continue to talk okay. about everything. Okay. The second thing concerning uh, the Arab League supervisors, uh, when you will think they will uh, okay. quit, especially after some of them were injured uh, two days ago? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Please. Um, if violence clearly can continue forever, what is the likely scenario, both internally, internally and externally? Okay. Yeah. Anyone from there? No. Okay. Yes, the last one. Could it be that uh, the confidence of Assad stems from the fact that his, his father's army murdered between 20 and 30,000 uh, in the world and even say boo? So yeah. He thinks that he can overcome this. Oh, okay. Clearly, if he uh, kills 20,000 people, he might be like his father, respected and uh, welcome leader uh, as, as, yeah, that's, that's politics. Now, 
Coming back to your question, uh, Lebanon. Well, they are waiting to see what uh, might happen in uh, Syria. I mean, there is a very delicate balance between the Sunnis led by the Hariri family and uh, with the back of the Saudis and the Shiites led by Iran. Iran may be a, a, um, Hezbollah uh, might be the uh, great loser from the, uh, if the regime collapses and, 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 and still there is a very delicate balance inside Lebanon. What might happen is that a collapse of the regime may encourage the Sunnis because it seems that the Sunni government might emerge in Damascus, or it can push Hezbollah to take some actions. But till it happens, well, what we see in Lebanon is that they all adopt a position of let's wait and see and do and do nothing. As, as for Russia, there is this traditional friendship between the Russians and the Syrians. Syria is the greater uh, buyer of, uh, so, uh, of, of Russian weapons. so. It's the question of, of uh, market for their uh, weapon industry, and, and, and there is the question of, uh, of you know, uh, the Russian perception. They see uh, the Arab Spring as a source of threat because it's all about Islam, and eventually it can get to Russia. So um, they believe they should support a secular regime uh, led, led by a close friend of uh, of. Uh, uh, Russia now. As for the Arab League, it's it's not the Arab League. The Arab League nowadays it's mainly Qatar and the uh, Saudis. And as I mentioned before, it had to do with the uh, uh, Iranian maybe Sunni struggle in uh, Syria. The Saudis and the Qataris uh, came to the decision to the conclusion that is finished and they should maybe help him uh, get to its end. Um, uh, so, so there is this question of the monetary group, but I think it's a waste of time. Eventually, uh, they will uh, come back to the Security Council asking for more sanctions and more uh, uh, actions against this uh, against the Syrian regime. I, I think it's important that actually the Arab League, led by the Saudis and Qataris, is to give a green line for uh, um, foreign intervention which I doubt whether uh, very much whether we see such an intervention. I don't see Europe or America uh, interfering in Syria. What might happen? Nothing. I mean, let us remember that the Middle East is all about gray, not black and white like in Israel. I mean, remember Saddam Hussein, 10 years after his defeat in uh, the 91 first Gulf War, he had control over Iraq, but the Kurdish area uh, had no control over the Kurdish area. The South, well, rebelled against him. It was very risky to um, take the road from Amman to, to Baghdad. There were sanctions, but he, uh, he survived and he had control over Iraq and uh, he managed somehow. This probably can happen also in uh, in uh, Syria. So thank you very much, and let me apologize for uh, leaving you early. And uh, the one who spoke, uh, who asked me about Lebanon, went another minute to show you uh, what people in Lebanon think about uh, Okay, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Uh, again, thank you very much. And uh, we move uh, forward to our uh, next uh, speaker. Uh, Professor Yudit uh, Ronen, um, she has, I would say, two hats. One is an academic, and as an academic, she has a, a position. She's a research fellow at uh, the Diane Center at Tel Aviv University, I assume, yeah, <laughs> correctly. And also, she uh, has a position at uh, the Bar Ilan University uh, in the Department of uh, Political Science. This is one hat. Which one? is more important, I don't know. And the other one is she is also a novelist and she published uh, books. I uh, can mention 
Uh, one of them, uh, which I've read, whiskey shall haruvim. How would I translate it into Charo English? Whiskey. Okay, yes, it's written here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> with this new uh, carob whiskey. Yes. Okay, uh, so anyone who's interested. Uh, Yudit Ronen is an expert on uh, Sudan and Libya, two countries which we usually um, do not hear so much until recently. Sudan with uh, the breakup into two states, uh, northern and southern Sudan, and Libya, of course, with the revolution, and of course with the whole... Uh, tragic, maybe, episode with uh, Gaddafi at the end of the, the Libyan revolution. So Libya joined the caravan of Arab revolution, and that's why it is a very important case study, and we are going to hear about that. The title of her lecture is uh, <clears throat> The Arab Spring in Libya, Society and State and Identity Crisis. Welcome and good afternoon. Uh, Professor Yal Zisser said that uh, Bashar Assad uh, believed that uh, the Syrians love him. Well, let me remind you that Gaddafi repeatedly stated that all the Libyans love him. But as it appeared, the Libyans really love him, but they prefer <coughs> him uh, to be uh, deeply buried in the ocean of dunes in the southern desert of the country. Um, I would uh, begin with the, with the beginning, uh, talking about the rebelliousness in Libya. First uh, kindled in Tunisia and then spread to Egypt, it was not uh, long before the rebelliousness um, further expanded to their Libyan neighboring state, penetrating in a pincer movement from the west and the east of the country in February, mid-February 2011. The giant flames of the Arab Spring, and every time, of course, when I'm referring to the Arab Spring, like that, save me, but the so-called Arab Spring. This term, as uh, Professor Poudet said, is problematic. Anyway, uh, the giant flames of the Arab Spring uh, found optimal conditions for inflammability in Libya's field of dry thorns, political ideological thorns, abundant with oil and marked uh, by strong popular grievances in almost every facet of life. Libya uh, had its own Mohammed Bouazizi, although in a different way. Fat hater Bill, Mr. Trouble, Gaddafi used to mock him, um, was known as a human rights activist and a brave lawyer, actually a leader, who intensively acted to free political prisoners from the notorious Abu Salim prison. The authorities, who perceived the bill's activities as a real threat, particularly at that uh, alarming juncture of escalating rebelliousness in the country's uh, immediate geographic environment, hurried to incarcerate him, uh, aware that uh, the bill's clients were members of the anti-regime violent Islamist movement, which has been traditionally based in the rest of Benghazi area. Uh, Gaddafi resorted, therefore, to harsh preventive measures. It was, however, this specific incarceration of Terbil that triggered immediate riots, which, unsurprisingly, had first erupted in Benghazi, the second largest city, and an historical base of the monarchical regime of Idrissa Sanusi, who was deposed by Gaddafi in 1969. Interestingly, the riots occurred two days before 17 February, the designated date posted on Facebook for a day of rage by Libyan anti-regime activists. Interestingly as well, the rebelliousness erupted just a half e a year 
before Gaddafi would have commemorated his 42nd, 42nd anniversary in power. The Libyan uprising promptly escalated into a full-fledged war, civil war, which soon uh, attracted uh, the military involvement of NATO and other forces, including uh, the intervention of Qatar, mind you, in what had become a six months long battle, bloody battle, battle, aimed at removing the Gaddafi regime from power. This goal was crowned with success in late August, yet it was Gaddafi's capture and horrendous assassination two months later that finally put the lead, lead on his rule, thus marking a significant milestone on the road of the Libyan Arab Spring. Yet, almost half a year after the regime's demise, the National Transitional Council, uh, the NTC in short, which was established during the war as the leading organ of what appeared then as a united rebel camp, failed to establish a new order let alone to offer significant relief for the, to the daily life of the people. The NTC had been headed ever since its inception uh, by uh, Mustafa Abdel Jalil, the Minister of Justice, until his defection from the regime um, in the early phase of the uprising. Alarmingly as well, the NTC has concurrently failed to curb the deteriorating chaos and violence. Almost a year after the Arab Spring had engulfed Libya, it seems that the tribal divisions, the geopolitical rivalries backed by the regional heavily armed militias, the religious political strife over the country's identity and faith, and the socioeconomic rage and conflicting interests might lead to another round of armed conflict in the country. The downfall of the dictatorial regime, which had tightly controlled all facets of Libyan life for almost a half a century, released all of the genies hitherto bottled up by Gaddafi. This immediately threw into the fall old and new grievances, hostilities, and conflict of interests, generating an uncompromising and powerful struggle for power in post Gaddafi, <coughs> or let's say the new Libya. More than anything else, this struggle has reflected the society's lack of what Gaddafi had persistently claimed to be national cohesion or national solidarity, national unity, whatever <coughs> term you prefer. Significant circles in Libyan society, which were harshly forced to rally around the Gaddafi regime's ideological and political line, have perceived the regime's collapse as a golden opportunity, which might not repeat itself anytime soon to reconstruct Libya's ideological and political identity as well as socioeconomic agenda uh, and the allocation of power uh, among the country's tribal and regional centers. Uh, well, given the short amount of time, I cannot afford, unfortunately, I cannot afford to deal with all of the ingredients of the Libyan identity crisis. Therefore, I will concentrate on what seems uh, to be a major factor in nourishing the divisions uh, in the Libyan society, preventing its progress toward the building of a wider national consensus and even more seriously accelerating its uh, sliding into civil war. This factor is the political religious strife raging between Islamists and the non-Islamists 
um, over power and the character of the state and society. Neither of these camps is homogeneous, however, in tribal, regional, or socioeconomic terms. It should also be um, noted that the Libyans are Sunni Muslims, perhaps I should uh, say it before. Um, all of the Libyans are uh, Sunni Muslims, so at least they save themselves uh, from a Sunni Shi'i schism or a Muslim Christian schism. Yet, um, the violent struggle between Islamists and non-Islamists, um, which dates back, in fact, to the period of the apostate uh, Gaddafi, <laughs> during which uh, the Islamist movement declared an all-out jihad against the infidel regime. Gaddafi was a devoted Muslim, according to his own perception. Uh, this has injected large doses of belligerence into the Libyan scene. Gaddafi made his utmost and fought back to uproot the Islamist movement, using iron fist measures, including, including a, a massacre of almost 2,000 Islamist prisoners in the Abu Salim prison in 1996. Nobody said boo. Good morning. Unsurprisingly, many Islamists in Libya departed to the sacred Muslim lands of Iraq and Afghanistan, not only to find a refuge, but also to fight as Mujahideen alongside their Muslim brothers to uproot the foreign military interventions. Most of the Libyan Islamists eventually returned to Libya, entirely dedicated to the concept of jihad as the sole way to overthrow Gaddafi. Others, uh, with uh, Yahya Ali B as a most prominent one, he was not the sole one, uh, have assumed senior positions in Al-Qaeda. And of course, concurrently, he has maintained close connections with home. While fighting in the war to eradicate Gaddafi, the Islamists were careful not to provoke Western governments and Libyan non-Islamist circles who all shared together the supreme goal of uh, removing Gaddafi from power. Therefore, questions regarding the extent of, in, of the involvement of the Islamists in the fighting, the identity of their uh, military and political leadership, their real strength, real power, and the political agenda they envisage uh, for the post Gaddafi Libya, all these questions remained unanswered. The same applied to other questions of whether or not the Libyan Islamists were affiliated or even collaborated with the global jihadi community. More questions were raised about existing contacts between Libyan Islamists and Al-Qaeda's uh, offshoot, Al-Qaeda of the Islamic Maghreb, known in short as Akim. Uh, for those who are not sure what is really Akim, I just want to say that uh, Akim uh, which uh, staunchly uh, supported the Libyan uprising as well as all the other Ar Arab uprisings, <laughs> has consolidated its power base in the Sahel area in relative proximity to the scarcely monitored borders of the vast and uh, sparsely populated southern Libya, bordering uh, country failed countries such as Chad, Niger, Mali, and even Sudan. Um, even as the rebels scored more diplomatic and military achievements, the Islamists still did not dare to expose details of their top echelon leadership or of uh, 
their determination to play a leading role in shaping the political religious face of the new Libya. Voices calling for the establishment of a Sharia-based state or the establishment of a Muslim caliphate were almost unheard of, mind you. The huge political and military void, which was widely opened in the aftermath of the regime's fall, allowed the organized Islamist movement to effectively influence the new order in the country and to advance to the political forefront of the largely paralyzed system. To some extent, and which is still, still uh, difficult to characterize, a certain overlapping has prevailed between the interests of the Islamist circles and some of the heavily armed uh, militia groups all joining the race for power. All groups have contributed to the chaotic daily life, reviving the dormant political animosities while concurrently creating new ones. Gaddafi had often spoke about national unity, Wahda Wataniya, or about the people's power, uh, the best system, the best democratic system in the world. Yani, uh, people's power, Sulta uh, along with other key phrases he had ardently coined while attempting to consolidate the facade of national cohesion and to emphasize his revolution's basic concepts and core values. In the post Gaddafi period, at least half a year after the demise of the regime, these expressions, these terms, should be replaced by anarchy, fauda, and crisis asthma. The Islamists, who are the most organized, most motivated, and best military equipped and trained forces in Libya, and who have been led by the powerful spiritual leader, Muhammad, Muhammad Salabi. By the way, his brother, Ismail Salabi, is the top military commander of the Benghazi area. And by highly the highly prestigious uh, and tough military commander of Tripoli, so we see the two centers of the country, Tripoli and Benghazi, are controlled by two Islamists. Uh, the one who is controlling Tripoli is Abdel Hakim al Bilhaj. Those appeared, at least for now, as having a better position in the race for power. Yet, uh, the non Islamist camp, headed by Jalil's relatively incompetent NTC, has its own advantages, with its open channels to the West being the most important. As already mentioned, there are other powerful domestic players, crucially among them the heavily armed tribal and regional militias, such as the Zintan-based uh, Khaled bin uh, al-Walid brigade, which captured and still hold Saif al-Islam, refusing to hand him over to the NTC. Definitely, it says a lot. It was during the euphoric atmosphere of the Le Libyan Arab Spring that the NTC declared, uh, declared its confidence that the banners of Libyan nationalist uh, of the Libyan uh, hero and symbol of Libyan nationalism and freedom, Omar al Mukhtar, will return, and I quote, to flutter proudly over Libya's blue sky. In the meantime, however, Libya's sky has remained cloudy and gloomy, far from the great hopes and dreams imagined by many in, in Libya and the West. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ronen.
Uh, we are going now back uh, to Egypt. We have started with Egypt. I mean, at the beginning of uh, the panel, I uh, was talking about the centrality of Egypt in the Arab world as uh, serving as a kind of uh, model for uh, the Arab world. And now uh, we are going to discuss uh, Egypt. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mira Tsoref is a lecturer at the Department uh, of Middle Eastern Studies at the uh, Tel Aviv University. And she's also a research uh, fellow at uh, the Diane Center, also at Tel Aviv University. Uh, she is an expert on Egypt. And uh, her last book, she edited a book on youth and revolution. It will come out shortly in Hebrew by Am Oved, which is very much relevant to what we are discussing and also to your topic. And the title of her topic is The Stolen Revolution. Did the Islamists truly steal the revolution from the liberal? Egypt is a taste case. Please. Good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me to take part in this uh, conference. The overwhelming victory of the Muslim Brotherhood Freedom and Justice Party and the outstanding success of the Salafist Al Nur Party became clear immediately after the Supreme Elections Committee released off the results of the second round of the elections for the Egyptian People's Assembly. The results clearly reflect the will of the Egyptian voter. For the Egyptian people, it was undoubtedly the formative historical moment. For the first time, the country's elections were both transparent and supervised by independent Egyptian judges, thus enabling the Egyptian voters to not only form their own political map but to nominate candidates of their choice for the People's Assembly and to do so without regard to the candidates' religion, ethnicity, gender, or social class. For each and every Egyptian, the recollection of the traumatic experience the country and had gone through during the previous elections, exactly a year earlier, on November 28, 2010, turned the elections of November 2011 into the ob objective itself. The long queues and the endless waiting to reach the ballot uh, boxes and the high percentage of voters, 62% in the first round and 67% in the second, reflect the fact that for the Egyptian people, the election of November 2011 symbolized the victory of the Egyptian revolution. The nationwide euphoria concerning the elections is reflected in a popular joke in which the, an Egyptian complains that the elections were unfair and illegitimate, as for the first time for many years, his long dead grandfather was deprived of the right to vote. And then nostalgically morons, where are the good old days of Husni Mubarak who demonstrated respect for the dead, unquote. At the forefront of these elections was the issue of the Egyptian collective identity. The voters were expected to choose either a platform espousing a secular identity along with a liberal agenda or a religious Islamic identity advocating a conservative platform. The results of the first round cons constituted a strong indication of the Egyptian voters' desire that Islam be a much more significant component of their identity than it was previously. This, however, doesn't necessarily mean uh, the Egyptians support the idea of the country becoming this, an Islamic theocracy, or that they believe that Islam can provide a solution, Islam as a solution for the all entire distresses. Moreover, since they perceive a sec secularism as an inseparable element of the discredited autocratic regimes that were overthrown during the Arab Spring revolutions, most Egyptians prefer a soft Islamic approach to, poli 
to politics. Actually, the majority of Egyptians sees no contradiction between their national and their Islamic identities, but rather view them as complementary oppositions, identity that can live and exist together in the marketplace of political ideas. Evident, evidence to this is the Muslim Brotherhood Freedom and Justice Party declaration that it, it is first and foremost an Egyptian patriotic party that considers a country's national interest its top priority. The assumption that the supporters of this party are mainly from the lower social strata that live either in poor urban uh, uh, quarters or uh, in rural villages of the Delta is not borne out of the facts. For among the party's supporters, one can find both members of the Egyptian elites who have come to terms with the ongoing process of Islamization taking place in their country, and young, highly educated, but unemployed middle-class Egyptians who enjoyed the social projects of the Muslim Brotherhood when it was still an opposition movement that was persecuted by Mubarak's autocratic regime. For example, members of the Muslim Brotherhood often paid unemployed young graduates member membership fees in professional associations in order to urge these associations to find jobs that suited the graduates' education and abilities. Moreover, since many young people weren't able to get married because of the high costs of the marriage bargain, the Muslim Brotherhood helped them by arranging and financing marriage ceremonies and by finding affordable housing. Although these initiatives did not solve the entire marriage crisis in Egypt, they did succeed in saving a considerable number of young men from being trapped in their late bachelorhood <coughs> and many young women from acquiring the unflattering title of old spinster. The Muslim Brotherhood is thus deeply planted in the hearts of many Egyptians. Sondos Sondos Asim, a 24-year-old year woman, graduate of the American University of Cairo, is one of the above young Egyptians, and is also a typical Muslim Brotherhood activist. She is from a middle-class family, speaks perfect English, and is writing a master's thesis on a social media. As a Muslim Brotherhood activist, she helps in running the Brotherhood's English language Twitter feed, Ikhwan Web. Sondos rails at the Western presumption that the Muslim Brotherhood would oppress women and emphasizes the fact that her own mother is one of many female Brotherhood affiliated candidates running for parliament. And I quote, it is a misconception that the Muslim Brotherhood marginalize women she states assertively. On the contrary, the Muslim Brotherhood is against the brutal practice of female circumcision. They certainly intend to solve the real problems of women in Egyptian society, namely illiteracy, poverty, and lack of education. Sondos, who wears a hijab, maintains that the Brotherhood embraces a moderate form of Islam. We are not the ultra-conservatives that people in the West and vision, unquote. It is impo important to note that not only observers in the West are concerned about the Muslim Brotherhood. The victory of Islamists expressed in the election results has become a major concern of Egyptian liberals in general and of young revolutionaries in particular, and is, is often expressed in sarcastic Egyptian humor. One example, is the joke that tells of the Egyptian society being divided into two main group, groups. Takfir wal Ijra, the typical extremist and fundamentalist Islamic movement, and Tafkir fil Ijra, a completely imaginary group that tries to come up with creative, out of the box ideas as to how to immigrate as soon as possible from Egypt. This takfir tafkir play on words reflects both the frustration and confusion that accompany Egyptian people these days. 
Another indication of, uh, of this is again expressed by one liner making the rounds within the Egyptian circles about the well-known and controversial Egyptian film producer Inas al-Daridi, who produces the film The Seekers of Freedom, which deals with women that seek gender equality. According to this quip, she has become religious and wears a niqab and is going to produce a new film to be entitled The Seekers of Freedom and Justice, Hawiya Wal Adala, which is, of course, the name of the Brotherhood's political party. The Muslim Brotherhood is fully aware of concerns both within and the country and outside about its policies. Although it has now gained the political legitimization for which it has yearned, Member of, members of the party neither rested on their laurels nor conducted virtual dialogues with their supporters, as other liberal and youth parties chose to do. While the latter, in order to gain a few more days of grace, were no, negotiating with the military Supreme Council in an attempt to postpone the elections, the Freedom and Justice Party openly presented itself to the people in its first conference, held on a street in Cairo and attended by hundreds of local residents. In the course of this conference, the first rank leaders of the party outlined the goals and views. Muhammad al-Baltaji, one of the party's secretary generals and the Muslim Brotherhood icon, was the first to speak. He reminded the audience of Mubarak's 40 years rule, declaring, and I quote, that we lived in a terrible nightmare, but God enabled us to bring down a president, a vice president, a government, and a corrupt parliament that was based on 100% rigged elections, unquote. Other mem members summed up the party's vision as well as its sociocultural goals stating that the party intends to realize three main objectives, unemployment benefits to help those who cannot find jobs, medical insurance for everyone, and a higher quality of education. Although the party's top priority as declared at the conference is to improve the standards of living of the poor, its main aim was to highlight its presence and visibility in the public sphere. At this very same time, activists of the other political parties remain virtual candidates, actually persona in Kunu, which undoubtedly one, was one of the underlying reason, reasons for the failure of the revolutionary and liberal candidates to win the elections. Another cause was the, these activists' continued addiction to the euphoria of the revolution's A day when they should already have been focusing on the Sisyphean labors of establishing political parties, formulating fa platforms, and choosing a representative leadership. Moreover, the Muslim Brotherhood's Freedom and Justice Party aligned itself with a newly formed democratic bloc that was composed of eight uh, liberally inclined parties such as Al-Waft, Al-Rad al gadid al karama Nasseris Party, al Ahrar, the Arab Socialist Party, al Jil, and the Egyptian Labour Party, most of which, of which are veteran ones. Their purpose in doing so was to emphasize their shared universal enlightened values such as democracy, human rights, and modernity. Since the elections results were published, the Muslim Brotherhood has been making great efforts to emphasize the substantive difference between the Brotherhood and the Salafists al nur party, which achieved an uh, impressive and unexpected gain in both rounds of voting. Mahmoud Razlan, one of the prominent leaders of the Brotherhood, stated that one should distinguish between the various Islamic streams and not view all Islamic movements and parties as one monolithic piece. For example, unlike the Al-Nur party that advocates the establishment of an Islamic theocracy, the Freedom and Justice Party is among the pragmatic al wasatiyah streams of Islam. Furthermore, the supporter of, the supporter of Al-Nur are residents of the poor urban neighborhoods and the rural areas, as well as blue-collar workers. 
in a country like Egypt, where 40% of the population is defined as poor, and six out of 10 households earn less than $277, there can be no wonder then that such a party, which provides social and religious services free of charge, achieved such an impressive popularity. Contrary to that, Muslim Brotherhood has a significant support base among the middle and upper classes as well. However, both parties adopted a direct approach towards their supporters. For example, to combat an out-of-control garbage crisis in the coastal city of Alexandria, Salafist doctors have been knocking on doors to raise consciousness among people about the negative health consequences of peeling up one's garbage on the city's pavements and streets. At the same time, Muslim Brotherhood volunteers have set up neighborhood food markets where they uh, sell vegetables, fruits, and meat at below market prices to poor people in order to combat price hikes of basic foodstuffs. In addition to their activities for the sake of the Egyptian people, the Muslim Brotherhood redrafted its platform that was first published in 2007 in the spirit of the revolutionary messages. For instance, they canceled the clause relating to the establishment of a council of senior religious persona to whose rulings both the president and the prime minister were obliged to accept. In the updated platform, however, it is stated that the main task of this council will be only to clarify rulings of the Sharia to various governmental institutions. In the revised platform, the, the Brotherhood also emphasizes their support in democracy, which reflects according to their view the Maslaha. Nevertheless, they identify democracy with the Shura, the Islamic principles of consultation. By Islamizing democracy, they try to prove that the democratic idea is not a Western import, but an Islamic authentic idea that accords with its belief system and as such is not considered a bid'ah. By, uh, by doing that, they justify their ultimate demand of the Sharia becoming the main source of legislation. The Brotherhood adopted also the human rights discourse and omitted the clause that stated that neither a woman nor a copt can serve as a president or as a prime minister. In order to express both the solidarity with the copts and their yearning for national unity, the leaders of the party have called on Egypt's ruling military council to provide security for Christian churches during the Coptic Christmas celebration on January 7th. Since Huria Wal Adala steering victory in the second round of elections, its leaders have also taken steps to ally the anxiety of Egyptian liberals regarding rapid process of Islamization in their country and to counter the criticism of the young members of the movement who, feeling that the veteran leadership has become too conservative, decided to leave the movement and establish a political party of their own, entitled Al Tayar al Masri, adopting a much more liberal ideology that is closer to that of the April 6th Youth Party. There is also no doubt that the resounding electoral success of Huria and Adala party signifies the arrival uh, on the Egyptian political scene of a brand new model, an hybrid one, that combines an Egyptian national ad identity along with an Islamic one, and modernity along with Islamic religious tenets. Uh, the party's members are also active, uh, an active participants in the vivid discourse on the rights of women and minority that is taking place in post-revolutionary Egypt. Uh, and rather than divorcing themselves from the West, they both engage in and enjoying introductory, introductory meetings with Americans and Europeans who are very curious about them and are courting them in order to be more acquainted with them, both personally and ideologically. Whether it is a, a pure verbal apologetics or an adoption of moderate tactics and strategies, one can assume that both the burden of governance 
and the fear of a possible failure, as well as the necessity of responding, as promised, to Egyptians' pressing needs, may force the party to adopt a pragmatic policy that will enable it uh, the formation of a coalition with the liberal parties and to respond to the demands of the Egyptian public that became a crucial factor that can no longer be ignored. Thank you. Thank you very, Thank you very much. Before, before we move to, to the question um, part, section, uh, I would like just to uh, exploit the opportunity and just uh, to say a few things before we wrap up uh, the conference. So again, uh, uh, thanks uh, due to Jenia Yudkevich and uh, Dr. Nimrod Goren. Both of them are here. Yeah, Nimrod is here. Where is Jenia? Oh, she's not here. Okay, you both of you, you were mainly responsible for whatever happened here. Thank you very much. And also for the organizing committee, uh, Amnon Cohen, May Khatina, Steve Kaplan, Eyal Gineo, and myself. And thank you, you all, for attending the conference. Now, we'll move back to our section. Now, um, I have a, I'll start with my own question to both of you. Uh, Libya and uh, Egypt. What are the prospects of a real democratic revolution, in your opinion? I know it's just an assumption, but what are the prospects of a democratic tran transition? And if so, how long will it take? Yes, please. Yes, Yoni. that uh, arose to me when I saw the events of the Arab Spring uh, during the last year. We saw that in Libya and Syria, uh, things that uh, you know, this are left, um, whatever you can answer this, uh, we saw that in Syria and Libya, the people uh, came back to the, to the former flag, uh, that the burning flags of the state uh, before Assad and Gaddafi rule, and uh, in Egypt, uh, they still uh, use the same flag, and they even uh, it was still it was still a symbol of proud and uh, uh, proud of the, of the nation. And I wanted to ask uh, why why is that, and uh, if you saw any discussion going on around this issue. Okay, uh, Rafi. Sure. Uh, I want to ask uh, Mira. Uh, you you seem to use you and others you are not the only one the word uh, democracy according to the to the meaning that we know and you know there are, there is a wide use of the the same word and everybody claims it's his democracy and at the end when you analyze what it is anybody who studied democracy and the Arab or Islamic world comes to this conclusion <coughs> that they, they don't mean exactly. Uh, the democracy that we mean. Even Mubarak, in his time, in one of his interviews to the press, he compared himself with Sharon. Sharon is a dictator. He's a very strong-handed man and so on. Look at Egypt. I am elected for the fifth time by 90% or whatever in the vote, and he was convinced that that is democracy, not uh, what Israel has and so on. And the conclusion for me is like, it simply they don't understand what they're talking about. It's not that they know what democracy is and they cheat and they rig and so on and so forth. They simply do not understand what democracy means. Uh, go and ask Assad. Afi, it's a statement or a question? Well, it can be both. <laughs> <laughs> that was not the purpose. <laughs> and uh, and my, uh, my uh, conclusion, if you like, is that looking for democracy in those countries is like sending a blind man into a dark room to look for a black cat which is not there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was a remark that begs an answer. That's it. It wasn't a question. Yes, please. Uh, concerning uh, Libya, first of all, I would like to know uh, if uh, there are uh, now uh, 
preparation for a new constitution and when will be the election and if you do you expect will be a new modern democratic party will be created like uh, in uh, Tunisia or in Egypt and concerning Egypt uh, I would like to know uh, uh, what do you think about uh, this uh, temporary marriage between the army and the Islamic uh, Brotherhood parties and the Salafis. If this matter will continue and will, or if it will be broken because the army is a secular, is pro-American, while the Islamist army, they cannot be like that exactly. So anyway, maybe they will break, uh, break after that uh, concerning debates on the constitution or concerning the election of a president. <coughs> okay, thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah uh, just uh, to follow up to uh, Yoni's question about the flag uh, in Egypt, the fact that they haven't brought back to the old flag before the um, free officers revolution, I was just wondering about two options. If it could be, first of all, a testament to the um, strength of the free officers, uh, I mean, to the revolution as a whole, it was actually uh, institutionalized in the Egyptian uh, script, in the Egyptian way of life, and actually that it's more than just Mubarak yeah, himself as a leader, as a symbol. But, um, uh, it's more complicated than just you know, other cases such as uh, Libya, or maybe because the um, uh, military is still actually in command uh, via the Supreme Military Council, maybe they're not going back to the old ways because they know that things haven't changed so much. It's much more of a gradual process than an actual revolution overnight. Um, so just um, wondering about your input to these uh, two options. Okay. Yes, please. <clears throat> My question to Mirat Swift. Uh, did, are there any reactions in clerical circles uh, on the uh, rather pragmatic statements <coughs> made by uh, Muslim brotherhoods uh, uh, leaders, especially in the change of the reform of the 2007 platform in a more really uh, liberal respect? Okay. Okay. Yes, we had here two questions. Yes, please. This Can you stand up maybe if they don't see you? Yes. This is to Professor Ronan. Uh, the fragmentation of the Libyan society today that you, are, you have so well outlined begs the question whether we are witnessing again what happened on the eve of independence of Libya in 1952, i.e., namely the threat of a split between Tripolitania and Cyrenaica. Uh, that is how, problem, how uh, realistic such a thing in light a, of a Libyan inherent fragmentation, tribal society, and two, past history. And then one other short question. Do we have any clue as to the uh, YMD, the uh, weapons of mass destruction, which allegedly were eliminated by Gaddafi uh, in his rapprochement with the West. Okay, yes, please. Uh, once the Muslim Brotherhood, the uprising of Muslim Brotherhood uh, in Egypt, uh, are the goal, if, if the goal is uh, to actually rule in uh, Egypt, uh, second of all, the influence of uh, this uprising uh, on the Brotherhood uh, in, the, in the whole world, Jordan, if you like, uh, Hamas is too. Uh, and about uh, Libya, uh, uh, Islam in Africa, uh, we know that uh, Gaddafi maybe was the bad guy in this story, but uh, he succeeded to, uh, to to some influence about the immigrants uh, to to uh, Europe uh, of uh, Africans, and uh, what now? Okay, last question, please. Yes, last question. Uh, I'd like to ask, if, uh, if in your, your opinion, if the inability of the West to curb or stop the the uh, flow of the of the mercenaries to Libya was one of the factors that prolonged the, prolonged the war, what is the what's going to happen to the uh, to the mass outflow of all the weapon systems? Uh, and I think it has been one of the factors that has helped to under, undermine the situation also in in, uh, in, in Egypt. Is there any chance? that the new regime in Libya will uh, have any type of relations with, with Israel. And, and lastly, as far as uh, Mubarak, if he had been, in retrospect, 
if he had allowed Israel or invited Israel to help to develop the agriculture and all the other technologies that Israel is famous for, could that maybe have prevented what has what has happened the spring of uh, in, um, in in Egypt? Okay, thank you. Uh, before I give the floor to the speakers, I just want to respond to the question of the flags. Indeed, I've written a, an article on the Arab flags, perhaps the only one to, to my knowledge. And I would say that uh, in Egypt there is much continuity in terms of using the symbols and the national signs. And also, you are correct, I think that uh, the flag is very much associated with the very idea of the revolution of the 50s, which is not negated. I mean, Mubarak <laughs> is very much denied, I mean, uh, his name and whatever is associated with him personally. And this is perhaps why in Libya, the flag, to my knowledge, Libya was not one of my case studies, so uh, you did maybe you'll say something different, was very much associated with Gaddafi himself uh, personally, as I see it, his ideology, the green color and whatever. And that's why they returned back to the monarchy and raise the flag of the monarchy. In Syria, by the way, during the 20th century, there were 10 flag changes. 10 times the flag has changed. So it is not unique in Syria to change uh, the flag. OK, let's start. Dr. Uh, Professor Onen will be the first, then Dr. Soref. Five minutes, if you can, uh, uh, each one of you. <laughs> <laughs> To talk about uh, democratic life in the immediate range uh, in Libya uh, is like to talk, and I will quote Gaddafi himself, uh, to ski on the sands of the Sahara. This is his quote. Libya has no civil society. Libya has no army. The army was Gaddafi's one. It was crashed. There is no military in Libya. There is no communication establishment in Libya. There is no organized authority to deal with the economic affairs of the country, particularly with the oil, which is almost 100% of the country's earning in foreign currency. Libya is hydrocarbon state. Uh, there is no government, although there is a government. So <laughs> Libya has to march a long way until uh, it could establish democratic patterns. Uh, it has to begin from scratch. And in the meantime, uh, the chaos, instability, insecurity um, prevent uh, the progress towards this goal. Uh, about the flags, uh, the Libyan flag, Gaddafi himself had changed the Libyan flag uh, certain times. Uh, one of the most dramatic was when Egypt uh, signed the peace agreement with Israel in 1979, it was his way to protest, and then he moved to the green flag, Libya uh, equal to Islam. Because of that, when I'm talking in my lecture, I said apostate Gaddafi, infidel Gaddafi, it's a problem. Uh, uh, now, the return to the monarchical flag is a kind of nostalgic, in a way, and of course, a demonstrative act uh, to uh, deliver a clear cut message. We delete the Gaddafi regime, the Gaddafi era. We begin from uh, the days of glory, uh, the days of the monarchy. And I already said that the Libyan revolution erupted in the Benghazi area, where the monarchical regime uh, came from, okay? Uh, about, um, I, I'll move uh, quickly uh, to Professor Maurice Romani. Uh, by the way, uh, and excuse me for taking one minute of your time, Professor Maurice Romani wrote a, a, the best book on the Libyan Jews 
since you are a, a, an English-speaking uh, audience, it is written in English. Excellent book. Excuse me for <laughs> saying it. Now, uh, for the question itself. Is it uh, uh, realistic to divide Libya today between the Tripolitania area, which is in the west of the country, and Kirinaika, which is in the east, where Benghazi is located, near the Egyptian, bordering Egypt. Uh, this is actually a, a return to concepts of the uh, pro-Qaddafi uh, era. Uh, but I think, although I don't know, of course, and the, everything is possible in the Middle East, but as it seems now, it's, it's not going to happen. It's very complicated economically, tribally, regionally, uh, politically, uh, with connections with the uh, regional environ, uh, either in the Maghreb area, e either in Africa, either in the direction of Egypt. It's very complicated for many reasons, so it doesn't seem to me as uh, realistic, but again, who knows? We are in the <laughs> Middle East. Um, about the uh, WMD, weapons of mass destruction, uh, thank you for this question, because I think this is a, a, a very important and serious issue uh, having implications also on Israel. Uh, Libya is uh, one of the huge arsenals of weapons. Uh, everybody has it, his own uh, habits. Gaddafi loved weapons. Since he had a lot of money, he nourished his habit, and Libya is full with weapons, sophisticated weapons, missiles, from uh, various kinds, uh, including chemical uh, weapons. Uh, according to Gaddafi's decision in uh, 2003, uh, he relinquished WMD, and there were some procedures which had to be taken and eradicate Libya's WMD. But as we know, uh, procedures are very good, but not always respected, and there is still chemical weapons and other uh, conventional weapons. And now, after the regime's demise, uh, everything uh, went to everybody. The one who had the money to pay, he took the money, and uh, it's uh, actually it's, uh, running through uh, Libya's borders uh, either to the Maghreb, either to Akim, which I just talked about, uh, either to, uh, to Sudan, to the Darfur area, to fuel the border, uh, to Niger, which is very troubled nowadays, to Niger, and by the smugglers of arms, uh, to the Sinai area, by the Bedouins, into the uh, Gaza Strip, and so on. So it's a very serious problem. Uh, another, sorry, a minute of your time. Uh, here uh, there is Asaf, Asaf Gibor. Uh, he's a really Gibor. Uh, mm -hmm. he's, uh, he was my student, and I'm very proud you are here. He's now a journalist. Uh, thank you for your uh, question about Islam in Africa. Uh, again, apostate in Fidel Gaddafi? No, Gaddafi was a devoted patron of Islam. He did a lot and he invested a lot of money and efforts in strengthening the position of Islam, uh, not only in Libya, but also in Africa. Uh, so uh, he did a lot. Uh, and uh, one may even uh, go to be beyond Libya's strip, regional strip of Niger, Mali, Niger, and so on, and move uh, into the depths of Africa and see a lot of uh, mosques uh, and other act Muslim activities uh, which Gaddafi was their patron. Um, yet he was a, 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 a opponent of the uh, radical Islam, of Islamism, 
and he would not uh, like to see what happened uh, today in Nigeria, for example, uh, definitely not in, in Sudan, in Algeria, uh, in uh, Egypt and other, uh, Tunisia and other places. Um, about the immigration, this is my last, yeah, I'll try to be brief. Um, Gaddafi uh, was a, a, he was not a, the bad man with regard to various essential interests of the West. Uh, one of the interests that he really served well was the curbing uh, of the, at least trying and largely succeeding to curb the immigration, the African immigration, propelling itself from the depths of Africa through Libya, uh, towards the Mediterranean Sea, and then illegally moving towards Europe. He did a, a good job, and nowadays everything is open, and a part of it, again, we can see it here in Israel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll be very brief. Okay, can you uh, take the microphone please? Thank you. Uh, as to your questions, uh, question, Ellie, uh, you know, as an historian, I cannot predict whether there might be a democracy in Egypt. What I can say is that um, I don't see uh, in Egypt, uh, in the near future in Egypt, a real democracy, and I will re relate to your question as well, Professor Israeli. Uh, what I think it might be is a softer autocracy that take into consideration the will of the Egyptian public. That's what I can predict. And here in this room, I will deny that I predicted. Um, uh, and it's oh, okay, <laughs> so I have a problem. Uh, and to your remark, Professor Israeli, I agree with you uh, that. Uh, uh, the Egyptian various political party has no exact idea as to what democracy really means. But it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that they don't have a dream of democracy, a vision of democracy, an aroma of democracy. And I think most of the new political parties, at least the liberal and the youth ones, really dream democracy. So uh, this what I can answer as to this. As to the uh, question about the Egyptian flags, I think there is no need to change them because, as Eli said, they have both components. They have the Islamic component and colors, and they have the national uh, uh, component. And this is exactly the two components of the current Egyptian identity, so why to change them? And as to objection to the updating of the uh, platform, uh, you know perfectly well that the Muslim Brotherhood are not a is not a monolithic uh, uh, movement and po political party. You have inside it the more moderate and you have the more conservative. But as to the updating of the platform, it was a consensus among them that it should be a uh, change and in the spirit of the uh, revolution. So no objection. Um, uh, as to the agricultural aid of Israel, you know, an historian cannot answer if number three, what would have been if. Uh, but um, although I'm not a Marxist, I can say that the revolution would have happened even if there was a greater agricultural and industrial and cultural, etc., head of Israel to the Egyptian. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. I want to thank uh, the speaker, Professor Onen, Professor uh, Dr. Toref, and Professor Eyal Zisar, to thank all of you coming, attending, and we'll uh, hopefully see you on our uh, next conferences. Thank you.